if you think about that moral prerogative, it demands personal responsibility and it rewards self-discipline. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those of us that are classical liberals are primarily in the liberty business. We're primarily in the liberty business. Now, a lot of people play lip service to liberty, but many people don't realize how profoundly important liberty is. Liberty is not just nice. It is nice, but it's not just nice. It is essential for human physical well-being and human spiritual well-being. In the physical sense, in the economic sense, in order to be productive, in order to be innovative, in order to be creative, an individual must be able to think for themselves. If somebody makes you, forces you to act like 2 plus 2 is 5, you literally cannot think. And many government rules and regulations force people to act like 2 plus 2 is 5. In addition, all human progress, by definition, is based on innovation and creativity. Because unless somebody does something better, which will be different, there cannot be any progress. Innovation and creativity is only possible to an independent thinker. Somebody that thinks like the crowd cannot be innovative, cannot be creative, cannot contribute to human progress. That's why entrepreneurs are so important. Without entrepreneurship, there's literally no human progress. And I'm sure we have some budding entrepreneurs in this room. Entrepreneurs are the heroes of the economic system. They take the ideas of scientists and engineers and turn them into reality. What characterizes entrepreneurs? Well, first, they're experimenters. They try a lot and they fail a lot. For every Google, there are 10,000 failed Googles. For every Walmart, there's 100,000 failed Walmarts. They're out-of-the-box thinkers. They explore things in different ways. They see things that other people don't necessarily see. When I was your age, if somebody had given me an iPhone and said, you know, in your lifetime, this machine's going to have all the characteristics that an iPhone has, and it's going to be, I can hand, I put, hold it in, your, in my hand, I would have thought they were crazy. I said, maybe in 200 years, but not in my lifetime. I don't know how Steve Jobs saw an iPhone. I don't know where that came from. In order to be that kind of, in, uh, of independent thinker, you have to be free to think for yourself, to pursue your truth, to see things in different ways than other people see them. Communism and socialism is doomed, are doomed to failure. They're doomed to failure because they destroy innovation and creativity. Make a list of all the major innovations that came out of the Soviet Union, North Korea, Cuba. It's a really short list. Make a list of all the innovations that came from government bureaucrats, hundreds of thousands of government bureaucrats in the United States. It's a really short list. Um, innovation and creativity is a source of all human progress. Cato published a book about a year and a half ago called uh, Poverty and Progress that looked at human well-being from time immemorial and from the evolution of Homo sapiens 250,000 years ago until the late 1700s, human life expectancy basically was flat. There was some minor improvement in the quality of life, but no improvement in life expectancy. And something happened in the late 1700s. It was an invention that transformed both life expectancy and the quality of life first in Western civilization and now is doing it throughout the world. It was an invention more important than fire, more important than the wheel. It was the invention of the rule of law, of individual rights, of free markets, of a system we call capitalism. And capitalism transformed the quality of life on this planet because it was the only system that really allowed people to be free to think for themselves independently, to pursue their truths, and to be rewarded for their innovations that improve the quality of life for lots of other people. In order to be productive, in order to be innovative, you have to be free. Liberty is essential for human physical well-being. Maybe more important, it's also essential for human spiritual well-being. Spiritual well-being in the context of the pursuit of happiness. When I'm talking about happiness, I'm not talking about having a good time on Friday night, although it's good to have a good time on Friday night. I'm talking about happiness in the Aristotelian sense of a life well lived. 
uh, what I call blood, sweat, and tears happiness. When you're 80 years old, you look back and say, man, that was tough, and I'm glad I did it. Happiness in that context has to be earned. You cannot be entitled to be happy. In order to earn happiness, you have to have a purpose in your life. You have to set goals to accomplish that purpose. You have to work to achieve those goals based on your beliefs and your values as a free and independent person. Being free doesn't guarantee you'll be happy, but if you're not free, it guarantees you will not be happy. So liberty is essential for human physical well-being, and it, in a more important sense, it's essential for human spiritual well-being. Let's talk a little more about the pursuit of happiness. Um, I believe that the, the pursuit of happiness concept is expressed by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence was a the world-changing idea. Before Jefferson, before the thinkers of enlightenment, Everybody existed for somebody else's good. To the king, to the state, to the church. Nobody existed for their own good. Jefferson said that each one of us has a moral right to pursue our personal happiness. We're not guaranteed success in that pursuit, but we have that right. That idea created the most successful society in history and the most benevolent society. When people have the right to their own lives, they're naturally nicer to other people. In socialist and communist societies, everybody ends up hating each other because they're all slaves to each other. And I agree with, the, with Jefferson that each of us has a moral right to pursue our personal happiness. Let's talk a little more about the pursuit of happiness. Look, you know, pursuing happiness sounds good, but wait a minute. You're really going out and pursue your personal happiness? How selfish can you be, right? And selfish is bad. Bad to be selfish. I can see Johnny in the sandbox, three or four years old, playing with his truck, not bothering anybody, having a good time. Along comes Fred. Fred would like to have Johnny's truck. Johnny doesn't want to give Fred his truck. Discussion, debate, argument ensues. Uh, mom, dad, Sunday school teacher, kindergarten teacher gets involved in the argument. Mom says, hey, Johnny, give that truck to Fred. Don't be selfish. Don't be bad. Two great moral lessons being taught right there in the sandbox. First, where did Fred get the right to Johnny's truck? You know where our social welfare system came? There it is, right in the sandbox. <laughs> and now, Fred thinks that Johnny ought to provide him with a Chevrolet Tahoe. Why not? Why not? How about Johnny? What lesson did Johnny learn in the sandbox? And I suspect practically everybody, maybe everybody in this room is Johnny or you wouldn't be here. What lesson does Johnny learn in that sandbox? For some reason, he has a moral obligation to take care of Fred. Even though Fred is lazy, incompetent, not a person he'd want to spend five minutes with. Interesting obligation to assume. Interesting obligation to assume. Let's talk a little more about selfish and let's define it properly because a lot of confusion on that. Let's define it as acting in one's rational, long-term self-interest. Acting in one's rational, long-term self-interest. The reason we get the def get the definition right is important. We get a false alternative, and the false alternative is to take advantage of other people or self-sacrifice. Neither one of which make any sense. In fact, a lot of times when you talk to somebody and they think about selfish, they, they're thinking about taking advantage of other people. Here's the irony. Taking advantage of other people is not selfish. It's self-destructive. It's self-destructive in two ways. First, uh, you might fool Tom, Dick, and Harry, but they're going to tell Betty, Eric, William, and Sarah, and nobody's going to trust you. And if you're not trusted, you're not going to be successful, and you're certainly not going to be happy. You probably know people. There's also a deeper issue. Um, we all want to influence other people. I'm trying to influence you tonight. But if you let go of reality, if you let go of the facts, and you try to manipulate somebody else's mind, somebody else's consciousness to your advantage, you're going to do far more damage to you than you do to them. Um, in my career, I've had the interesting opportunity of meeting lots of successful people. 
it's interesting that I have met a lot of people that have uh, made a lot of money who I think got there by taking advantage of other people. And they're the most unhappy people I have ever met. <coughs> taking advantage of other people is not selfish, it's self-destructive. Uh, how about self-sacrifice? That's the moral code that underlies our society, right? You hear it everywhere. You hear it at home, at church, at school, in the media. We're all supposed to self-sacrifice. Um, I want to ask you to ask yourself what I would argue is the most important question you can ever ask yourself. If those of you that have children or grandchildren or expect to have children or grandchildren, ask yourself honestly how you'd like your children or grandchildren to answer this question. Here's the question. Do you have as much right to your life as anybody else has to their life? Do you have as much right to your life as anybody else has to their life? Of course you do. Of course you do. Why would you believe anything different? And by the way, if you do not have a right to your life, then nobody has a right to their life. Because if I don't have a right to my life, and I don't have a right to my life, and I don't have a right to my life, and I don't have a right to my life, and I don't have a right to my life. If none of the eyes have a right to their life, then nobody has a right to their life. And that's when the tyrants and power lusters show up, right? Because they know how to use your, your life. They had to know how to use your life for what they perceive the common good to be. So in order to defend anybody else's right to their life, you must be first defend your right to your life and obviously if you want your right to your life respected you have to respect other people's right to their lives each of us has the right to live our own lives how we want to as long as we don't use force or fraud to take advantage of other people and you have to be willing to fundamentally defend your right to your life if you're going to defend anybody's right to their life so taking advantage of other people and self-sacrifice should be the one making sense. But there is a rigorous, demanding moral code that underlies free and prosperous societies and also is the foundation for personal happiness. We are fundamentally traitors. We trade value for value. Life is about figuring out how to get better together. Life is about figuring out how to get better together. When I was running bb and we had a gut-level commitment to help our clients achieve economic success and financial security, and we expected to make a profit doing it. Life is about figuring out how to get better together. There are only two stable relationship conditions, win-win and lose-lose. Whenever you get greedy and you set up a win-lose, your partner will get bitter. You see this in spousal relationships. Whenever you set up a, a lose-win, uh, you'll get bitter, and you end up in a lose-lose relationship. In any meaningful relationship in your life, you should ask, what's in it for me? But you should also ask, what's in it for them? Because at the, at the end of the day, if there's nothing in it for them, there'll be nothing in it for you. Life is about creating win-win relationships and figuring out how to get better together. Uh, and of course, it is in your rational self-interest to help the people you care about. Your family, your friends, the people you work with, human relationships are very, very valuable to you. Um, in fact, if you love your children, helping your children is not a sacrifice. In fact, love is the ultimate expression of selfishness. Now, most people don't think of it that way, but uh, let me kind of concretize that for the college-age students here. You're getting ready to get married. Big event in your life. Your future spouse comes up to you and says, Honey, I'm so excited about marrying you. This is the biggest self-sacrifice I've ever made. Not exactly what you wanted to hear, right? Um, if you really value somebody, if you really love somebody, you would risk your life to protect them. I would be hate, hate to be faced with the choice of my life versus one of my children's lives. But if I was, it would be an easy choice. I would choose to die. Because I couldn't live with myself if I made a different solution than that. And, and that's because I really, really love my children. 
Love is an expression of selfishness. I believe it's in my rational self-interest to support the United Way. The United Way is an umbrella charity organization. It does a lot of good in the community in which I live. I wouldn't want to live in the kind of community that would exist if there were no United Way. And I wouldn't want my children to live in that kind of community. I believe it's in my rational self-interest to support the United Way. I support a lot of charities. I give a lot of money to charities. However, I believe there's a difference in kind in me choosing to give my money voluntarily to a charity and the government using a gun to take my money and giving it to whoever it is that they want to give it to. I believe that's a difference in that. Um, so what would really be required for you to act in your routes of rational self interest to promote your own genuine deep level happiness? Um, well, the first thing you have to do is what I call hold the context. Sometimes when we talk about selfish, we're talking about people that take advantage of other people. Other times we're talking about people that are what I call self-focused. You know, people like that all they do is think about themselves. The irony of that is that's not rational. That is not in your rational self-interest. You have to think about the context. And here's a kind of meta question. is what kind of world would you like to live in? And what would you enjoy doing? Moving the world a little bit in that direction. I believe that everybody in this room uh, wants to make the world a better place to live. I think that's a natural human attribute. But I also believe that each of us has the right to run lives, so you should make the world a better place to live doing something you want to do for you. You would have a sense of purpose, making the world a better place to live, doing something that you want to do for you. It doesn't have to be grand. Maybe it's just you know, opening a restaurant so I have better food at lower prices. It, whatever you believe that you would enjoy doing moving the world in the direction you'd like to see it moving. You'd have a sense of purpose. Secondly, you'd take care of your body. You'd eat right. You'd exercise. You'd take care of your mind. You'd read, study, think. You'd work hard to create healthy relationships with other people that shared your values. And you'd have a rational value system. What if everybody had a purpose? Did the best they could to take care of their body. Did the best they could to take care of their mind worked hard to create a healthy relationship with other people that shared their values, and had a rational value system. I would argue that 90% of the world's problems would go away. A huge percentage of the world's problems would go away. People say that the problem with the world is that everybody's selfish. My observation is very few people consistently act in their rational self-interest. Most people act in some self-destructive manner. I had a brother-in-law. Drank 24 beers a day. Got cirrhosis of the liver. Drank 24 beers a day and died. People say he was selfish. No, he was self-destructive. Bernie Madoff, the guy that stole hundreds of millions of dollars from his family and friends. Madoff said the best day in his life was when he got caught. Can you imagine spending 25 years stealing from your family and friends? That's not selfish. That's miserable. Miserable. Um, in order to promote a free and prosperous society, you must begin with your right to the pursuit of your personal happiness and your respect for other people's rights to pursue their personal happiness based on their beliefs and their values. Let's talk about happiness one other level. Happiness in that Aristotelian sense of a life well lived. Blood, sweat, and tears happiness. When you're 80 years old, you look back and say, yeah, I'm glad I did it. That kind of happiness is based on real self-esteem, not the wrong mind and cliche stuff that you often hear in school today, but real self-esteem. Self-esteem is a complex subject, but I want to share a couple thoughts about it. Self-esteem is fundamentally self-confidence in your ability to live and be successful in the fact of reality. So you earn self-esteem by how you live your life. Nobody can give you self-esteem. You cannot give anybody self-esteem. You cannot give your children self-esteem. Self-esteem has to be earned. Live your life with integrity. Live your life consistent with your values and your principles, and you will raise your self-esteem. That's why integrity is so important to your success and more important to your happiness. Second thought about self-esteem. For everybody in this room, and for the vast majority of people on this planet, the single biggest driver of your self-esteem is your work. You spend a disproportionate amount of time, effort, and energy at work. 
Um, and I'm defining work in the broadest context. Raising children is important work. Whatever you define your work to be, what makes it important is it drives your self-esteem. Something I said many times to the employees of EB&T. You know, it's real important to EB&T that you do your job well, but it's far, far, far more important than you. You might fool me about how well you do your job, you might fool your boss about how well you do your job, but you'll never fool you. If you don't do your work the best you can do it, given your level of skill, given your level of knowledge, you can't do the impossible, but if you don't do your work the absolute best you can possibly do it, you will lower your self-esteem. By the way, for the college students here tonight, your schoolwork is your schoolwork. If you don't do your schoolwork, the best you can do it, given your level of skill, given your level of knowledge, can't do the impossible. If you don't do your schoolwork the best you can possibly do it, you will lower your self-esteem even if you get a good grade. Now here's the good news. The flip's also true. Do your work the best you can do it, given your level of skill, given your level of knowledge, and you will raise your self-esteem, which is more important than whether you get a good grade or a promotion or more money. Because it's about your character. It's about who you fundamentally are as a human being. There's actually a very significant social implication to that concept. Take a uh, construction worker, a bricklayer. He has a really tough, hard, grinding life. My granddad had that kind of life. That bricklayer has a really tough, hard, grinding life, but he and his, his wife successfully raised their children. Maybe his granddaughter becomes CEO of a publicly traded company, maybe not. He has a tough, hard life, but he gets something very precious from his work. He gets to be proud of himself. He gets self-esteem. Take that same bricklayer and give him welfare. He may be better off financially, but he loses part of his soul. He loses his pride. You know, there's a lot of uh, discussion in Washington, D.C. about security. Both political parties are talking a lot about security. Unfortunately, the discussion is attached from economic realities, lots of fake promises, but even if it were based on economic reality, um, it would be off mission. Americans care about security, but this is not the land of security. People didn't get on a boat and come to Jamestown to be secure. The United States is a land of opportunity. Opportunity to be great, opportunity to fail and try again. But most importantly, the opportunity of that bricklayer to live life on his own terms. Pursue his personal happiness based on his beliefs and his values. Pursue his personal happiness as a free and independent person. That's why people came to America. That's the unique and special sense of life that made America great. That's very important that we protect. Thank you very much for listening. be glad to answer questions about anything. It doesn't have to be about what I talked about. It can be about any subject anybody wants to ask about. You gotta find a brave soul. <laughs> it's hard to get a brave. There's a brave man. So what's your idea on universal basic income? Universal basic income? Um, I think universal basic income would be better than the welfare system we have today, but I don't think we're going to get rid of the welfare system we have today, so I think they're both bad because I think they both uh, actually uh, destroy human motivation. I think, as I said, I think it's a very important role for charity. I think that's different than using force to take away somebody from and give somebody back. Americans give so much money to charity, if 10% of them were actually getting to poor people, all the poor people in the United States would be rich. There's this huge thing called the government that screens out 90% of the money. 90% of the money just goes somewhere else. And, and that's, it doesn't get to poor people. It's a subsidy for rich people. Subsidy for big companies. You know, we, we spend billions of dollars subsidizing companies like General Electric. So, so, so I'm, a, I'm opposed to it, not because I, it wouldn't be better, but we're going to keep both. And I think we ought to get rid of welfare. But we ought to start with getting rid of welfare for business, for rich people.
Uh, you're very really welcome. Okay. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Um, in your book, you mentioned uh, some struggles that we have with our. Oh, thank you. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, you mentioned in your book about the struggles with the modern American education system, and I think you kind of touched on needing to get back to maybe a Socratic method or something like that. Can you explain a little bit? Well, let me let me say in general, I think the most important issue we have in America is the failure of our K-12 education system. And it's particularly bad for low income kids. And the, and the failure rates are stunning. And there's, not, there's no correlation between how much money we spend and the outcome we get. Washington, D.C. spends more per capita than, than uh, any other place in the United States and has the worst outcome. So there's no, there's no correlation. I'm an advocate, and, and, and I, I'll put this, I know you're, what you're, I'm going to get to the question over here. I'm an advocate of the privatization of education. I think we ought to be subsidizing students and parents, and you ought to take the money and you ought to spend it the way you want to for education, your choice. We shouldn't be subsidizing schools because what it destroys is the incentive for innovation and creativity. You know, in business, we like to talk about being innovative and creative, but we actually hate it. Because who wants, to, you know, who wants to change if things are going along well, right? <laughs> Why not make a lot of money doing things? And then there comes somebody along that has a better idea. Well, how unfortunate that is. Uh, but competition forces us to change. Public schools don't compete, right? So they don't innovate. Basically, the education you're getting today is what I got in the 1950s. So can you imagine if phones were in the 1950s or anything else with the 1950s? Uh, airplanes, cars. But it, it just, we've been stuck because there's no competition. I think there's a Sam Walton out there. There's a Bill Gates. There's a Steve Jobs who revolutionized education. And I think the big beneficiaries would be low-income kids. So I'm for the privatization of education. Subsidize students, subsidize parents, but let the market drive education. And what that would leave is a huge level of, in, of, of innovation. I think, I, I'm an advocate of what you would call the soccer, uh, the, the, I think you all guys ought to have mentors in a certain sense, and you ought to be treated as individuals. You're not treated as individuals, you're just treated in big groups, right? You're in the first grade, second grade. Who would design an education system? If you were doing homeschooling, you wouldn't educate all your kids in one big lump, right? You'd educate them as individuals. That's why homeschoolers get so much better outcomes. It was a lot less input, right? But you would be educated, and in a competitive world, you'd be educated individually. So, I, don't, I have to be careful because I believe in privatization education, but I don't know exactly how it would unfold. I don't know where the Steve Jobs is with the iPhone in education. I just know he's out there. I know there would be a revolution in education that would radically improve the quality of life and radically improve your educational system and make your system and make it a lot more fun. It doesn't have to be work. Education is fun. I know when I got through with college, I actually got to learn a lot. It's funny. <laughs> I had my own self-education program. And I learned a lot faster and a lot more efficiently uh, than I was learning in school. And, and I'm sure some of the older people here have had that same kind of experience. I think we need to privatize education. Subsidize parents, subsidize students. You guys go buy the best education. I have a method that might work, but I think there's, there's probably a lot better solution than I've ever thought of out there. And that's what we need. We need that experimentation. We need those 9,999 Googles that didn't work, or uh, Edison's 999 light bulbs that didn't work, and we would have a radical improvement in education. And so instead of solutions, I'm, I'm for the idea of let's, let's, let's create competition. Who else has got a question? Yeah, Jim. Uh, hi. Uh, so, uh, how, in your terms, do you live your life on your own terms? Like, as you, as an example, you know. Um. Well, I'm. You know, I'm I've been fortunate. I have a really good life. <laughs> uh, I start my. You know, I'm, I'm a classic American success story. My dad grew up in a house that didn't have indoor plumbing. That didn't. Have, they had a well across the street, and only the TV had in the house with a fire with a little fireplace that they could have done. Uh, he got a job at 17, um, working for the telephone company, all in New Guinea and the Philippines and all those kind of places. I was raised in, I'd call it lower moderate income, 
uh, family. I, mean, I went to work, I was making six hundred dollars a month, and I had a very successful career. And I and I live life on my own terms because I flipped, I created a purpose for myself in my career and pursued that purpose is with, with the constraints of the real world, right? It wasn't I got to do anything I wanted to do. There weren't there were a lot of laws and regulations, some of which made sense, some of which didn't. But but I, within the context of reality, I pursued my own purpose and 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 I was able to grow personally and experience a lot of people with me that grew a lot. I focused a lot on my own self development. I read a tremendous amount. I, those of you that have taken accounting, I, I read all the I could have had a a master's degree in accounting. I did a lot of economic tests. I studied philosophy. I studied psychology. But that was all in the context of my purpose. And, and as the bank grew and I got hired in the bank, my purpose was to create the best bank possible, create a financial institution that was making the world a better place to live through helping clients, um, helping employees, helping the community, and making a lot of money for our shareholders, which we did. We did all that kind of stuff. So, yes, I, I would have been a purpose driven. Uh, person, uh, I you know I retired relatively early after a, a successful career because running a highly regulated business like e and I couldn't express my negative opinions towards government regulation as you might have think I had, <laughs> and I didn't think it was fair to my shareholders for me to you know go stick my finger in the eyes of people that had a huge amount of control over us. And then I ran Cato, which is a libertarian think tank, where I could actually say what I believe, uh, and that was another. All right, so one last question. I'm a member of CATO, and uh, so I'm a libertarian, and I'm curious if you think we're making any progress. Hmm. I wish you hadn't answered that question. <laughs> yes and no. Um, people that at least share the core of the philosophy I've expressed are actually growing very rapidly in numbers, but we're growing off a very small base. And on the other side, the progressive movement, mostly because it's captured the elite universities and controls the education in these elite universities, is growing faster off a bigger base. It's not growing at a faster rate, but it's growing off a bigger base. And that's where I see this conflict in ideas. And I do think it's fundamental. It's not the superficial stuff that you hear in the press. There's a very different perception of what justice is, uh, what's ethical, whether people have the right to their own lives. It's, it's a battle over big, big, deep philosophical ideas. And the superficial stuff going on here is noise. And unfortunately, and we don't have anybody representing the libertarian position out there. The, the arguments from both Republicans and the Democrats are really the same, the same arguments. They're just coming from a little bit, but they're all status arguments. They're all, they're not talking about a real free society. You know, I would just take us go back to the, the basic ideas that the founding fathers said, although there were plenty of flaws in the Constitution, but I don't, I, I'm not super optimistic we're moving there, even though we do have a growing base. 